improvisation on guitar is a little bit of a dying art form, especially in the online world. And I think there are quite a few reasons for this. Most videos that you see online these days are pre-recorded, pre-composed. They are then edited and then mimed to. Now, I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with that. My feelings on this topic have changed slightly in the past couple of years, but it does mean that we have a whole load of players that suffer when it comes to improvisation and not really knowing this fretboard. So today I want to talk about a number of different things that might be holding you back. These are things to work on if you want to get better at improvisation in 2024. And before we go into the main part of the video, I just wanna say that all of my lesson packages are currently on sale for 30% off using the coupon code down below. So if you want to get on the right path in 2024 and you want the discount on these lessons, then definitely check them out. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that if you liked the backing track, then that is available over at Music Bro as well as some licks that you can play over the top that is this month's monthly lesson so definitely check out the link down below there too without further ado let's look at some of the things you should be working on in 2024 if you want to get better at guitar improvisation point number one music is a language i am a massive massive believer that in order to be able to improvise well you need to be listening and replicating other people doing the same thing essentially. So that means transcribing players that you really like. That means copying what they do in terms of their time feel, their rhythm, their vibrato, their subtleties. You have to emulate, much like when we're a baby and we first learn to speak our native language, we are just replicating what our parents or carers or whatever say. This is the same for music. I would argue that you need to be listening to truly great improvisers if you want to get better at it yourself. You need to see what they do in terms of, say they have a certain chord type, what do they play over the top? Study and analyze it and see if you can replicate it on the instrument too. You cannot learn to speak French in a day. That is truly impossible. And it brings me on to the idea that with improvisation, it takes time. I think this is the main enemy of modern guitar players. You know, there is this kind of need or want to constantly post on social media to get eyes on your guitar playing. When it comes to improvisation, some of these concepts can literally take years and years before you truly feel like you have a grasp of it. And I always relate this back to this idea that, sure, you might be able to pick up a couple of words in Spanish if you are surrounded by it for a day. That does not mean that you can have the conversation. That just simply takes time and practice. Without further ado, let's move on to a more technical point then. Point number two, you do not know the note names on your fretboard. This is one which I see all the time, even with super high level players, they can get scuppered by this idea. And I will say that if you don't know your note names, then visualization is just gonna get much harder, regardless of what method you use later on. I think a lot of guitarists tend to learn the note names on the E and the A string and then disregard the rest of it. You should be able to identify where the note A is on any string regardless of where you are on the fretboard. If you're looking for an exercise to get good at this, I would say all you need to know is like the five position pentatonics or the cage system. And essentially you could go through each position and find the note A. So we could go position one, position two, position three, position four, position five, and back to one. You play that all together. Then what you should do is move to a new key. I would say that rather than just doing it chromatically, I don't think that really helps. You should use the cycle of fourths. It's a very jazz thing to do. Basically, we could go up to the note D here and we do the exact same exercise. It's very tight up there. But essentially you carry on around that system. You could do G. Truly try to internalize where those notes are and the names of them. 
Now, there are tons of different exercises you can do. You can do single string exercises to get used to this. You can give yourself challenges where you limit yourself just to two strings, finding the note names, all sorts. But I would say that is one of the biggest reasons why people struggle with improvisation. If you don't know at least the name of the root for, say, using the intervals way of doing visualization, then you're pretty much screwed. Let's move on then to point number three. You don't have a solid visualization method for understanding the fretboard. Now, this is definitely one of the biggest things that holds most players back. Doesn't matter whether you're gonna use cage system, three note per string, or the intervallic way in which I like to do it, guys like Tom Quayle who taught me it, then you need to know this fretboard as much as possible. Now, don't get me wrong, it is a lifelong journey in terms of being able to see this thing. It is not like a keyboard where you have C and it looks the same as it change octave, changes octaves, I should say. This, we have multiple different ways to play each note. And if we use a certain finger, that's gonna determine what we can access nearby. It really is a struggle, but I would say, regardless of which visualization method you choose to use, whether that be three note per string, or cage system or that intervallic way, you should definitely hone in and focus and see if you can see scales, arpeggios, triads, etc. using those systems. If you are interested in a solid method for that, then definitely check out my fretboard visualization course over at my website. Remember, it's 30% off using that coupon code. But that is just a way of, say, bringing those three things together, three no per string cage system and the intervallic way of doing things, as well as how I like to view arpeggios, triads, and all their inversions, etc. Let's move on to point number four. Point number four, Time feel is arguably more important than note choice. What do I mean by this? Well, having a solid internal clock, if you like, and phrasing where everything is perfectly in time, or how we say with feel, say just behind the beat, being able to control this and play with confidence is key. I would argue that this is actually way more important than the actual notes that you play. I would rather hear someone play something super simple with just say a pentatonic scale in box one where everything is nice and tidy in terms of the time and the confidence and the execution is there rather than hear someone blast a million notes but the time feel is all over the place. The reason I say that it's more important than note choice, what I'm gonna try and do now is demonstrate for you playing over the same backing track where it's D minor if you want to think of it that way but I am going to play completely outside using things like sidestep and chromaticism all of those things I'll play actually a lot of the time in D sharp minor so going up a half step you'd think that would sound awful but hopefully with this example you can hear that because my time is so confident as a listener your ears probably should accept it. I say that and this can go horribly wrong, but let's check it out. Hopefully you can hear there that all of those outside notes sound like they make sense because the time feel is so good because our brains like to hear patterns and they like to hear that tension and release. Basically, the time feel makes you understand those notes and make sure you accept them essentially. But anyway, let's move on to another super important thing that you should be looking at in point number five here, and that is subtleties. By this, I mean dynamics, 
vibrato, string mending, note manipulation, basically. And this is one which gets overlooked massively, especially in this world of editing. This is the hardest thing to kind of mime. So a lot of guys avoid doing this because it gives it away straight away that it's not like a live thing. All I'm gonna do is show you one simple phrase, this, and if I play this with no subtleties, no dynamics, it sounds kind of flat. There's nothing there. What we should look at is how can we manipulate those notes in some way? Can we use some string mending? Could we get this kind of idea? Could we use slides? Could we play it in a different area of the neck? So I could go. That's cool. That's cool. I'm looking here at how hard I'm attacking those notes. You know, do I really dig in? Do I use legato? That's just one simple phrase, but it can be played in millions of different ways. Not just this. Or even worse, getting the vibrato wrong. I hear this quite a lot, this kind of thing. <laughs> Out of tune, not nice, or too fast, you hear this. No control, you know. There, that is just a case of focusing on those subtleties and really having a solid grasp, solid grasp, I should say, of the fundamentals. I think that I would much rather hear a player play with less technique, shall we say, but with a strong vibrato, good time feel, and good control over all of those elements we've just spoken about. So in point number six, I want to talk about technique. Now, there are two very wrong school of thought, in my opinion. There are the guys that say, I don't need technique at all. I just play with feel, man. I think this is wrong. You should definitely look at your technique. It's just gonna help you to play more advanced ideas, whether that's legato, alternate pick and whatever. You want to be able to basically have more tools in your arsenal. But on the flip side, I do believe that there's an absolute obsession with technique where people treat it more like the gym. You know, it's like, okay, can I play this exercise at 120 BPM and they'll play. over and over and over again until they get to super speeds. But then what is the musical context? You need to always apply anything that's technique based straight away into music, at least that's my opinion. So I would say never dismiss technique and never dismiss it as part of your practice routine. I certainly have a lot of fun with technique, but don't treat it like the gym. It's always got to have some kind of musical purpose. For me, at least, if we're talking about being a musician and a guitarist and an improviser, try and find a way to incorporate that in context, say, over a track, over some chord changes, whatever it is that you're working on with your improv, don't just repeat the exercise over and over again. That's simply what I'm trying to say. Point number seven. Make sure you are playing with other musicians. This, I cannot stress enough, is the most important building block when it comes to improvisation. For me, I think the biggest jumps in my own playing were when I was like 18, gigging full time in a covers band, basically playing with a singer that encouraged us to try and make the songs our own. You know, the band itself had two really amazing gospel musicians, a keyboard player and a bass player. And on the gigs, you know, we'd have no rehearsals. It'd be the same repertoire, you know, like over and over again. But we were encouraged to mess with the harmony, to reharm things, to have solos, to interact with each other, essentially. And that taught me way more than any kind of lessons or anything that I was working on in the practice room. I know it might be a bit more difficult these days because everyone's so used to being at home all the time, especially with what happened, you know, 2020. But if you can play with musicians that are way better than you, they are going to teach you so much stuff just by playing together. You know, I think even Tom Quayle can attest to this. I had lessons with him and he gave me the absolute perfect 
solid foundation but really the jumps in my playing came afterwards when I was playing with these other musicians live. You know, it was forcing me to learn different styles. It was forcing me to understand the, the guitar's place in a band, but it was also making me do the thing in front of a live audience. You know, there's no second take like there is with a camera. You've got one opportunity to make a solo sound good. You've got to be listening to the other musicians. You've got to interpret what can I play here? What's the drummer doing? Can I play with him? Can I mess around with the rhythmic aspect? What's the keyboard player doing? What chords is he throwing at me? What's he implying? Can I, you know, imply an outside sound over that chord? There's so much fun to be had playing with other guys, but there's so much information that can only be taught in that way, especially if players are better than you. And on the flip side, if you're playing with guys that are maybe like a few levels below, that can teach you invaluable things as well. There was a few drummers which we play with sometimes back home where their time feel was not great. But your job, rather than to follow them, is to kind of imply the time feel to them and be like, right, this is where I'm feeling this. It doesn't always work, but again, it's a game of like listening and responding or trying to show your idea. And believe me, sometimes those gigs where I was playing with guys who were not as high a level taught me more than playing with the big guys where it's like everything works. So I would say if you can, this is a huge point that you should take away from this video. Try and play with just another human being, not always just the backing tracks on YouTube. Point number eight, find a solid teacher. Now, I know in this day and age, there are lots of self-taught guys, but this applies in the same way. If you are using things like YouTube or the internet to learn guitar, then I would suggest that you find someone that is actually providing useful information. I know a lot of the things on the internet these days can be kind of confusing and you're getting information from all kinds of different sources. I would pick just a handful of channels that you find are helping you that have a solid understanding of the subject that you want to learn or the concepts that you want to learn with improvisation and stick with it. You know, there are tons of great teachers out there. I love, just off the top of my head, people like Jens Larsen. Um, Rick Beato's got some great stuff. Tom Quayle, my old teacher. Martin Miller, Rick Graham, guys like these. They have such a solid understanding, but also very, very good teaching methods. These are things that are invaluable. You know, there's lots of videos out there where it's like, here's the hack, here's the trick. Believe me, it's a waste of time in 99% of the cases. You know, you can practice something for, you know, a thousand hours or 10,000 hours or whatever it is. And if you're not actually practicing the right things, you're not gonna get better. Whereas 10 hours with a correct concept with solid foundations is gonna get you much further. And it is difficult, I know, they, they are just a handful of names that I've mentioned. I'm trying to think of others now off the top of my head. Ben Newson, he's a great one. Um, you know, like some tons of the guys from JTC really have a strong grip on this, Jake Wilson, guys like that. But essentially don't be distracted by the, here's the quick hack, here's the, you know, here's the secret ingredient that you need, forget about all that hardware, no it needs to be a solid foundation. For me, having lessons with Tom Quayle, even though we only had six or seven, I think, private lessons, they were absolutely invaluable, and I am still using these concepts all the time up until this day. This brings me on to another point here. Recording yourself, I think, is the absolute must if you really wanna grow. You know, I was lucky in the sense that I started YouTube when I was 15, so that's 15 years ago now. But there are videos from back then that I use as almost like a practice diary. You know, I can see the things which I really was awful at back then that I developed over the years. And still, even to this day, videos that I put up, I mean, even the, the improvisation at the beginning of this, I'm sure within a week, I will absolutely hate that and ridicule myself for it because there's things wrong there that I need to work on. But having some kind of diary of your practice, you can write it down, but what I'm saying is it's so easy to record things these days. You need to be listening to yourself and be brutally honest. Don't think, okay, that's good enough, let's move on. Analyze it, 
do I know my fretboard well enough there? Was my time feel good? Was my vibrato okay? You know, all of these kind of things you should be basically mentally noting down or even physically writing down, like I say, when you listen to that audio back and just make a note of what needs to be worked on. It could be a technique thing, could be phrasing. You know, you could say, oh, my phrasing's getting stale. Let me check out another guy doing it and let's transcribe some lines. It's just good to hold yourself accountable and being brutally honest with what's wrong and what needs working on. This brings me on to the final point here. And I will say, this is called Embrace the Suck. I think that's a, a phrase I stole from Ash Stone, the drummer. But essentially, when you are practicing, it should not sound good in the beginning. When you're actually practicing, you are doing something that is new or it's something that you struggle with. You need to totally embrace the fact that you are going to sound bad at that to begin with. And only by doing the hard work, whether that takes 10 minutes or whether that takes, you know, thousand hours are you gonna progress with this you know i totally totally believe that if you listen back to yourself and you think that was amazing then there's something wrong you've got to analyze it and go what could i be better at you know and whether this is choosing a style that you are not comfortable with whether this is picking a set of chord changes that you can't outline you have to embrace the fact that you're going to sound really bad at first. The only thing that really, really helps is time and dedication. Very last thing I'll say is that this is something that doesn't get mentioned often enough on YouTube. Again, it's all about the short hacks and all that kind of stuff. Time is the most important thing. When it comes to improvisation, it's a lifelong journey. You never complete it. It's not like a video game where you get that platinum trophy. Although I know I am massively into that kind of stuff. This does not happen with music. It's just a journey and you slowly progress. You know, you slowly take ideas. You should not sound like a Ben Yunsen or a Tom Quayle if you've only been practicing this stuff for six months. It takes years and years and years to do. But don't fight against it. Just embrace that fact. You know, I had a young student, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly finish with this story, who came to me and he said, you know, Jack, I'm practicing all the things that you've given me, but where do you find the time to do this? And I was like scratching my head a bit like, what do you mean? And he was like, I have to post to Instagram, I have to make a YouTube video, you know, like I want to grow an audience. And I was like, uh -huh, that you know you still should be finding time to slot this in and he said it was different in your day you know like you didn't have the internet i did i'm not that old but um my point was yeah i guess things have changed a little bit people feel this pressure to post i would argue forget about that work on your guitar playing of course post the journey and see how it is treat it in some ways like a, a log you know so that you can see how far along you've got. Don't be afraid if it doesn't sound super professional. Not when it comes to improvisation. It's totally different if it's composition or you're wanting to show what you've been working on, you know, say in the, the DAW. But when it comes to improvisation, don't think that you're gonna sound top level with a little bit of work. It takes years. And sometimes, you know, we will never reach the heights of a Guthrie or a Frank Gambale or people like that. I've come to accept that those guys are aliens. What we can do is try and get close by just working on our phrasing, working on our technique, absorbing language, playing over as many different styles as we can, trying to form this all into our own unique voice. Anyway, guys, I hope this has been helpful in some way, and I hope you're going to enjoy your guitar improvisation journey in 2024. What have I missed? Let me know down below in the comments, or is there something that you would like to see covered on the channel? Is it a specific technique or, you know, a specific improvisation concept? I would love to know your thoughts. I love putting these videos together. It's a ton of fun. Don't forget, all of my lesson packages are on sale for 30% off using that coupon code. So if you want to dive into some concepts, check out my masterclasses. My name is Jack Gardner. Till next time. Cheers. Peace.